Hi, everyone. I'm John Shaw from the Geography Department here. Tim asked me to chat about some work that we've been doing here uh, in conjunction with the University of Glasgow, uh, which has resulted in a, a book just uh, coming out earlier this year. And in many ways, actually, it's kind of been preparing for the Horizon 2020 challenge of uh, smart, green and integrated transport over the last few years because we've been taking stock of where we are in the United Kingdom uh, in this area. And I think it's fair to say that from any macro level perspective, which, uh, whichever way you look at it, our uh, travel is neither smart nor green nor, as Andrew was kind of hinting there, particularly integrated either. So we kind of came to uh, address three key challenges or three key controversies about the way in which our transport works. First of all, we wanted to take apart the way that academics have traditionally written about transport. I'll say uh, a little bit more about why we did that in a second. And then we took on two more challenges as well, to, to uh, look at where we were in conceptual terms and the way in which we uh, understand the transport debate. And thirdly, we wanted to say, to put our marker in the sand, say what we should actually do about it. And when I reveal to you what this double whammy is, you'll think we probably should be doing something about it um, as we uh, as we go forward. Now, the, the way in which academics have tended to traditionally write about transport, we've done it rather earnestly, it has to be said, particularly in relation to sustainable transport. And we've all been saying, you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't do this, and we shouldn't be having fun, and we should all be going back to the dark ages, and so on. But when we do it, we compartmentalize it either by mode, so we write about trains, or we write about buses, or we write about cars. And as Chris said earlier on, actually, we don't really do that. We journey from door to door, and you will walk to the station and then get the train and then get a taxi or whatever. Or we tend to argue about how we should do it within our own disciplinary areas. And here's a debate from geography, which I won't rake over from you, but there are similar debates which go on uh, in other, in other uh, discipline areas as well. And thirdly, uh, when I woke up this morning, I was delighted to hear that this gentleman uh, made this slide very, very topical uh, today. Uh, one of the reasons why um, people like Mr. Clarkson there managed to have such sway uh, in the argument, at least in our view, is because we don't really, as academics, put our case forward in a way which is as easily understandable or digestible as uh, someone like he, him does. And put, drawing on Frank Fisher's very uh, erudite remark of some years ago, if the role of the academic is to minimize unproductive debate on pressing political, political issues of the day, we thought we'd better have a go at doing it. So what we did was we took the starting point of familiarity with any uh, involvement of transport that we all have, which is the journey. And so instead of writing about things by mode uh, or writing about things by sector, environmental damage, social damage, we wrote about them by journey. And we said, well, well, a typical family, what journeys do they make? Well, they do the school run, they do the commute, they do the business trip, they do the family holiday, they visit friends and families. And we took each one of those different journeys explain what they did, how they got there, and then um, picked up all of the transport issues which uh, are relevant to those particular journeys. And we used, over here, uh, this is a, a device from the Financial Times at the last election, motorway man and motorway woman, Paul and Susan Smith, and their children. And um, they live in a nice detached house, and they both own a car, and uh, one of the kids goes to the local city technology college, and so on and so forth. And the reason that we picked that device is because they're electorally very important. They're not particularly numerous, but they are swing voters, and they're in swing constituencies, and they've been in the mind's eye of transport ministers for many, many years, as we have predominantly favoured uh, the car in British tr uh, transport policy. So that's inverted, the book is not black and white like that, but that's uh, rather how we set it up, so there's a bit of a, an explanation of the journey, and then we start picking up on the, uh, the uh, issues of the day. So, the next, that's how we wrote about it. The next two controversies we picked up on um, how we conceptualise uh, transport studies. Generally speaking, there are two uh, ends and there's a continuum between them. The prediction provides, say, this is how many cars journeys are going to be made in the future. We've got to build this number of roads uh, or this road capacity to deal with them. On the other hand, there's uh, the, the, the new realism camp, which says we're never going to be able to build as many roads as we need to. So in which case we need to match uh, demand to supply rather than the other way around. And we kind of sit very much towards that second uh, area, but with a couple of uh, caveats. One of them being uh, an assumption about the new realism is a bit too earnestly sustainable for our view. Um, 
it seems to assume that the infrastructure we already have in this country is fine because if you reduce demand, then uh, the, the, the number of traffic jams, etc., will reduce. What we're saying is if you look at by any credible measure uh, of the performance of our infrastructure against that of our major European partners, it's pretty shoddy. We've got far fewer miles of motorway, far fewer miles of electrified railway, far fewer miles of high-speed railway. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. As some of our rural transport services are better than in France, but, you know, it's not really uh, uh, meeting the needs of the majority. The other thing is, Chris mentioned a uh, point about uh, different ways of dealing with sustainable transport. If you're going to insist on behaviour change, by all means, let's get more people onto public transport. Let's get people using the internet. Let's get people travelling less to start with. So, the amount of money we spend on transport uh, in, from Westminster and the devolved administrations, we waste Ladies and gentlemen, yes, that is right, the equivalent of two Jubilee Line extensions, one Terminal 5 or an HS1, that's the London St Pancras to the, the uh, coast, every year because we can't spend our money correctly. And it comes back partly to what Chris was saying about the, the planning system and, and any number of other reasons like an obsession with consultants. So <laughs> what are we going to do about it then? We thought we'd put, we'd put them out. Well, first of all, we, we ex uh, in, the, in the book we talk all the way about behaviour change, about mindset, uh, soft measures as well. Um, this, in a nutshell, is what we would do. Uh, I'll just pick out here very, very briefly, uh, we're talking about sustainability. Environmental sustainability, yes, we would build a third runway at Heathrow. And the reason we would do it is not for economic grounds, but for operational grounds and environmental grounds. A quarter of a million tonnes of carbon uh, emitted by planes stacking over Heathrow every year. And also, the slightest breath of wind or misty morning will cause airport chaos all over Europe, as you would have discovered if you tried to get through Heathrow earlier this week, or indeed when I flew back from Barcelona a couple of weeks ago, and the pilot described the situation at Heathrow that morning as carnage. And that's not something you want to hear <laughs> from a British Airways pilot in Barcelona when you're about to fly into London airspace. I'll pick up on this, how do you fund it? Well, there were all sorts of suggestions we have in the book, including the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the land tax there, uh, value, land value tax. Here's what, on social sustainability, immediately we should stop giving uh, free travel to old people. Immediately. It's an absolute, it costs a fortune, a billion pounds a year, and that money we could instead invest in improving bus transport for everybody. With my goddaughter the other day, we were seeing the wheels on the bus go round and round, and I suggested the new verse should be, the passengers on the bus don't pay any fares. <laughs> So, in conclusion then, our message in the transport debate that we, we sum together in preparation really for smarter, greener, uh, into more integrated transport in Britain is nothing new. People have been talking about it for a long time, but we've tried to do it in a different way. And by doing it this way, by exposing our own travel habits uh, and kind of semi-autobiographically living through them, we've been able to put our own perspective to the test, uh, and that's been extremely useful in preparing for future EU bids. Thank you very much.